Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the second day of the uh, work, uh, this uh, gift workshop. Uh, the title of the workshop is uh, uh, How the Planets Shape History, Geoscience, Human Society, and Civilization. Uh, yesterday, a uh, session was focused on uh, how uh, Earth processes influence, uh, influence the civilization. We see very beautiful uh, uh, paintings from uh, uh, Paleolithic caves. We also seen how the uh, geology of the area of Rome influenced the, the uh, Roman uh, um, sex in uh, all over the world. And uh, uh, at the end, we see how um, uh, natural phenomena such as uh, volcanic eruption may influence the, uh, the climate and the society for several years. In particular, we, see, uh, we saw how um, the uh, climate model results can be used to explore the impacts uh, that volcanic eruption can have on a, a society. Um, the topic of tomorrow, the session of tomorrow, of today, sorry, is dedicated to climate. Uh, we will uh, uh, explore some aspects uh, of the influence of uh, climatic processes on uh, human society and civilization during historical times. And uh, uh, just before um, starting, uh, I want to, um, uh, before Santi, I would like to remind you that uh, all the presentation and recordings uh, will be available on the GIFT uh, website. So we invite you after the end of the uh, workshop to disseminate uh, presentation and some activities that we will see during this day among your colleagues, uh, your students. This is very important to uh, transmit knowledge uh, um, to a, a large number of uh, students and teachers. Remember, please, to mute your, uh, um, web, uh, your microphone, uh, to disable your webcam, but don't uh, forget to ask questions after the uh, end of uh, uh, each presentation. So I think that we can start uh, uh, the session, um, the, the today's session. Uh, I don't know if uh, uh, Professor Yakawa is uh, um, connected. I have to, sorry, I have to. Hello, I'm connected. Good morning. Good morning. Adapt my condivision, okay. And uh, I have to, can you, are you able to share your screen? Just a moment, please, I'll try. So can you see my screen now? Okay, perfect. So welcome to the gift workshop. Uh, professor Iaka Iakawa is a, an assistant professor at the Nagoya University uh, in Japan. Uh, his research interests are focused on uh, uh, solar storms, uh, solar terrestrial environment, uh, sunpot number uh, reconstruction, and many other interesting uh, uh, topics. The title of uh, his presentation is uh, An Overview of the Historical uh, Space Climate, uh, as seen from uh, historical archives and uh, classics. So please, uh, Professor Ayakawa, um, we have uh, 50 minutes in uh, total. Thank you for your introduction. I'm Hisashi Hayakawa, uh, designated assistant professor of Nagoya University. I first uh, wish to thank all uh, you, uh, uh, you all for the organizing the uh, interesting and important conference and the invitation uh, to this opportunity. I'm going to talk about an overview of historical space climate as seen from the historical archives and classics. First, uh, let me introduce uh, who am I. Uh, uh, as I said, I'm working in the uh, Institute of Sun Earth uh, uh, Environment and the Institute of Advanced for Advanced uh, Research of Nagoya University and uh, Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in the United Kingdom. And I have been originally a historian, and I I also uh, visited several historical ar archives all over the world. And I have gotten two PhD degrees in science and history uh, to work on this interdisciplinary field. And uh, I'm, my main uh, focus and interest is on the, oops, oh, maybe I, I have forgotten to switch on my uh, video. I have just noticed about it. 
my the main for, uh, interest is on the solar terrestrial environment and its uh, short term and long term variabilities. The short term variability is known as space weather events, and uh, the long term variability is frequently called as space climate, as I have entitled this uh, presentation. And uh, such kind of uh, historic uh, uh, solar terrestrial environments has been uh, monitored uh, for centuries. And uh, there are a paper by uh, Brian Owens uh, uh, described that uh, such kind of uh, uh, historical measurement of the solar terrestrial environment uh, is one of the uh, longest running uh, scientific experiment in the human history as it lasted uh, uh, roughly four centuries uh, from 1610. Now their history can be traced back uh, 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 to, for example, uh, the history of the solar flare can be traced back to uh, 1859. Uh, back to the uh, Richard Carrington's sort of rare observation and back to uh, 1620 uh, 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 in Galileo Galilei's observations apparently but uh, actually the earliest observation was observations were carried out by uh, Thomas Harriot uh, whose original records are currently preserved in Petworth archives mm -hmm. as we need complex procedure uh, to approach such kind of archival materials uh, I, I just uh, provide the published drawing of Gary, Gary here. Uh, and, uh, but uh, as you can see here, there are some uh, different reconstructions of this uh, uh, sunspot number, uh, which I will address later. And uh, these observations has uh, formed our uh, quantitative uh, in the uh, indicator for the solar terrestrial environment over centuries. The solar activity ha has been evaluated uh, with uh, number of sunspot groups and number of uh, sunspots as well. And uh, such kind of measurements uh, starts from 1610 to the uh, running to uh, the present. And uh, they provide more homogeneous uh, reconstruction if we calibrate the individual observations well. And as you can see in this uh, figure, uh, uh, the reconstructions are generally consistent with each other uh, uh, after 1900. However, if we go back uh, their history, uh, uh, the reconstructions are more inconsistent before 1900, and we need to uh, look uh, carefully look at the original historical records to better calibrate such kind of records. And and uh, to uh, overcome such kind of difficulties, there are some uh, ongoing international collaborations uh, to uh, for recalibration of sunspot number. And so for uh, the and uh, among such kind of efforts, we need has to pay special attention to uh, some specific periods like the Dalton minimum uh, in the uh, early 19th century and uh, the Mounder minimum in the late 17th century as uh, their reconstructions are significantly different from each other uh, as visualized by uh, Munoz and Vaquero uh, in this figure. And, uh, besides their existence, is uh, the magnitude of these uh, these grant. Oh, sorry, there there was a typo. Uh, these secular and grant minim minima are still quite controversial, and as uh, as you can see in this figure, their so solar activity has significantly decreased in the last solar cycle. I mean, solar cycle number twenty four, which lasted from uh, two thousand nine to uh, two thousand nineteen, and uh, some some people has been interested in how deep the delta minimum and the boundary minimum was. Was it similar to solar cycle twenty four, or was it something even more extremely suppressed? But uh, uh, such kind of difference of the reconstructions uh, make it a little bit uh, challenging to answer this question. 
And uh, one of the chief difficulty of the reconstruction of the uh, sunspot group number in the mount, uh, no, Dalton down minimum is partially because uh, uh, it, uh, it is chronologically stated uh, between the uh, gap of two long-term observers, Staudacher and Schwabe. Uh, this is in this period. And according to Viramo et al., uh, there are two chief observers in this period, uh, William Herschel and Tadoy uh, Sterfringer. Uh, However, if we read the original historical document, uh, Herschel's uh, records are mostly descriptive and uh, they don't uh, include uh, sunspot drawings uh, like, like these. Uh, these materials, and it is sometimes challenging to interpret such kind of texture records. In this regard, uh, it is important to exploit uh, uh, the whole disk sunspot drawings uh, by Jeffringer, uh, but uh, uh, it was uh, quite challenging to access uh, this uh, his observe observations because uh, it was uh, stated in their historical archives. And according to the previous studies, uh, this is a reference of Derfringer, and Derf, uh, it says uh, he chiefly, uh, uh, and Schatten uh, chiefly uh, consulted Rudolf Wolf's astronomy schmidt and uh, the ori original uh, document has been described as Derfringer's uh, Son Sonnenfrecken Buchel manuscripts, Kremus Münster Sternwald, Kremus Münster in Germany. <laughs> However, uh, uh, how, however, of course, Kremis Minister uh, is not in Germany, but in Austria, as uh, visualized in this map. And it is, uh, I tried to uh, contact some people in Kremis Minister, but it took some time to locate the original manuscript. And finally, I managed to uh, visit the uh, Kremis Minister Observatory, uh, thanks to uh, the help of uh, uh, Father uh, Amand Kramo and I managed to consult the original documents uh, in, uh, in this ex uh, expedition. And uh, we started investigation of the original archival record uh, in the Dalton minimum. And this is uh, what Jeff Ringer has uh, recorded uh, during the Dalton minimum. And uh, he has recorded uh, uh, a number of sunspot drawings over the time uh, from 1802 to 1824. And uh, actually, Jeff Ringer's observations are quite significant because uh, it has a wide coverage during the wide chronological coverage during the Dalton minimum. And full disk uh, drawings are available throughout his observations. And we can see spot distributions, I mean, sunspot positions uh, from these materials uh, for the whole, whole disk on each date. And the sunspot area uh, seems tearing us something uh, while it is uh, it looks significantly exaggerated in terms of the area and there are some difficulties as well uh, uh, besides the area the observational timing was not explicitly endorsed and it was a little bit challenging to uh, determine the positions uh, by themselves but uh, fortunately uh, he recorded uh, these draw uh, drawings in sequence therefore we managed to uh, track the motion of the sunspots uh, to uh, constrain the sunspot position. And uh, uh, caveats must be noted uh, when we exploit such kind of historical documents because their original motivation was uh, uh, it's sometimes different. And according to Derfringer himself, his original motivation was the measurement of the sun's solar altitude in order to determine the local time. And uh, uh, his uh, telescope uh, has been preserved uh, in the uh, observatory itself. And you can see uh, the image right like this. And yes, uh, uh, it, according to Frank, Frank Schwab, uh, it was a telescope of 5.5 feet length. And he also has preserved uh, meteorological logbooks uh, as well. And currently, uh, his logbooks are preserved in four volumes. Uh, picture uh, taken here, and they are the example uh, uh, provided by current Minister of Observatory. And as you can see, there are some uh, small sunspot drawings 
around here uh, as encircled in a reddish color. And, uh, but uh, uh, we need some special attention to what uh, previous studies have uh, done because uh, previous studies have interpreted uh, the dates with such kind of measurements without sunspot drawings as spotless days. And, uh, uh, and for example, uh, there an absence of sunspot drawing on 1818 July 25th has been considered as a spotless day, but uh, this is 24th and this is 26th, and you can see uh, sun, uh, similar uh, sunspots in both on both dates, and it is extremely unlikely uh, for both of sun, sunspot groups uh, to disappear uh, in between. And actually, uh, if we uh, take a look at the uh, summary drawing uh, with this summary drawings uh, with these yellow yellowish discs. Uh, we can see the ex we can explicitly understand uh, the motion of such kind of sunspot groups. It came from here, here, and here uh, from 24th to 26th and 27th. And as I said, the sudden disappearance of these groups uh, is extremely unlikely. And moreover, and we, we need to be cautious if uh, these logbooks are very original or not. Because this is the logbook, as you can see, this is very large. And sunspot observation is a kind of a delicate task. It's not a weight lifting. And you need to carefully take a look at sunspot observations like this. <laughs> Therefore, if uh, you start a weight lifting with such kind of heavy material, it will uh, make your observation significantly difficult and uh, disturbed. And uh, comparing these materials, uh, uh, we have uh, we, we are currently considering that uh, there are probably uh, loss, and uh, moreover, there are some lost details in the summary manuscripts as well. And uh, we consider that it is more likely that uh, uh, they have uh, they had the same original daily uh, sunspot drawings, and uh, they have been compiled and uh, compiled from and what to say, uh, their uh, logbooks and uh, these summary, summary drawings have been compiled from such kind of materials afterward. And on this basis, we have revised uh, their ringers data uh, in the existing uh, records. And so far, all the spot rest days in Hoyt and Shatten, uh, the previous studies, Hoyt and Shatten, Vakero Edo, were actually solar altitude observations without sunspot drawings and uh, not usable for spot rest days, as pointed out by Vaquero and Gare Garego, 2014. And we have removed this data. And we have also revised the date uh, uh, for several parts. And we have also recounted all the sunspot groups uh, following the modern uh, definition of sunspot group uh, classification. And uh, we have taken the year average, which has been significantly revised. And the revised trend is more consistent with what uh, the uh, Royal Observatory of Belgium is uh, uh, providing, rather than uh, what can be found in Spalberg and Shatten's uh, group sunspot number data series. And uh, this is the, our result for the daily uh, sunspot group number counting. And uh, this is the comparison of the uh, sunspot group, uh, uh, the yearly average of the sunspot group number uh, with our research and uh, previous studies. Uh, the previous studies have been visualized by the black broken line. As you can see, the sunspot uh, solar cycles were broken in, uh, in their reconstructions. But uh, when we revise this uh, data on the basis of the original manuscript, uh, these curves have been significantly uh, revised. And now we can see the solar cycle uh, quite clearly. And we have also derived the sunspot position 
uh, on the basis of uh, the hit, uh, their fingers original uh, manuscript uh, tracking the motion of the sunspots and now how uh, uh, our reconstruction is something like this and uh, you can see uh, sunspots uh, in both solar hemispheres uh, just like in a normal uh, solar cycles but uh, this is significantly different from uh, the mound minimum, uh, which uh, I have mentioned uh, in the beginning of my presentation. At that time, uh, the sunspot position, the, the uh, sunspot appears on appears only in the southern solar hemisphere, uh, as shown in the figure below. And the solar cycles has been significantly suppressed according to Wusowski et al. and Vakero et al. Although some people still consider that there are some uh, solar cycle uh, surviving that kind of situation. And uh, for the, uh, for the solar, uh, sunspot observation in the Dalton minimum, the solar cycle can be evidently seen in the sunspot group number uh, uh, in contrast uh, with what has been seen in the mound minimum. And during the Dalton minimum, uh, we confirmed at least up to six sunspot groups uh, in their finger sunspot observations, whereas uh, during the mound or minimum, uh, uh, there are at, at best one to two groups in the core period. And the sun, uh, sunspots are lo uh, located in both solar hemispheres in the Dalto minimum, in contrast with the mound or minimum, where sunspots appear in the southern solar hemisphere mostly. And so uh, it, such kind of uh, revisions have been carried out in multiple team in uh, several countries. And uh, their recalibration has ended up some significant trend changes uh, in the solar activity. As you can see, uh, their uh, old version uh, moves uh, like a reddish broken line uh, with up rising trend and uh, after revision, it becomes something like pink, a pink broken line, uh, which is uh, which has a slight upward trend, whereas this is something quite stable. And uh, we wonder how far we can tra uh, trace back such kind of solar activity uh, beyond their onset of telescopic observations. And such kind of uh, sunspot number recalibration is extremely important when we extend our knowledge uh, with uh, with some proxy records like cosmogenic isotopes because uh, we uh, tend to calibrate uh, cosmogenic isotope data uh, with the uh, observational records. And moreover, after uh, nineteen uh, after nineteen fifty, uh, the human beings started nuclear tests, and that disturbed. Uh, carbon-14, for example, and uh, we can't use the modern measurements as a kind of calibration uh, point. And uh, in this regard, uh, for example, uh, their up, up, uprising trend has been modified uh, to some, something uh, uh, more stable, and this will uh, immediately influence other uh, solar activity re reconstruction. Uh, in the medieval to ancient uh, epoch. And uh, apart from such kind of cosmogenic isotope data, we can also use some historical records because uh, some, for example, the aurora has been a kind of footprints of the solar options. Uh, this is an example from the Carrington event in 1859 uh, when the first uh, solar flare has been witnessed. And uh, at that time, the white right flare caused a uh, significant geomagnetic storm and extension of the aurors uh, toward the low latitude regions as well. And uh, you can see the overall uh, visibility reports uh, all over the world, especially in the northern, uh, northern hemisphere. Even in the southern hemisphere, there are some reports uh, from uh, South America and uh, Oceania as well. And uh, such kind of intense solar flare caused significant ex uh, extension of the overall orbital equator. Earth. And similar thing happened in 1989, March. And at that time, uh, a significant uh, 
Sunspot Group uh, caused a number of solar eruptions and uh, uh, caused significant uh, geomagnetic disturbance uh, and extended the older uh, significantly greater world. And uh, the mag uh, and as ex exemplified in these uh, with these uh, case reports, the magnetic storms and all over has a signif uh, significant correlation uh, with each other. And actually, uh, such kind of uh, oral behaviors will represent uh, the solar activity. And uh, it would, uh, uh, John Dalton has actually noticed significant uh, re uh, reduction of the oral frequency. Uh, uh, between 1796 to 1826, and afterward, uh, this period was uh, named after uh, named Dalton minimum after John Dalton uh, by Sam Silverman uh, in the uh, Yosemite Conference. And uh, such kind of hints will allow us to uh, trace back the hist uh, history of the solar activity uh, in different methods. Uh, apart from the cosmogenic isotopes. And uh, there are some episodes uh, in the historical epoch, for example, uh, it uh, stores us and other people uh, consider that uh, Aristotle uh, may have witnessed uh, an uh, ancient candidate older uh, as recorded in his methodology. And this has been tentatively associated with uh, other candidates older in uh, 349 in Prini and 344 uh, BC in Timorion uh, st uh, story in Plutarch uh, in Stoza's uh, uh, paper. And uh, this is, and when we compare uh, such kind of reports, uh, this is chronologically located in the bottom of the Greek uh, grand uh, minimum. Uh, learning from 390 BC to 330 BC as visualized in uh, Ueto's uh, figure. And uh, at, at that time, uh, Aristotle was at Athens uh, and Assos, and according to uh, Barnes, and uh, we can uh, understand that uh, there were significant Germanic storm uh, back in the time of Aristotle, although the solar cycle, uh, solar activity has been significantly suppressed at that time. This is a kind of yeah, unique solar storm uh, in Greek uh, minimum. And uh, we can further uh, extend other history uh, back. Uh, for example, this is a, a trace copy of the uh, cuneiform uh, tablet from uh, of the astronomical diaries from Babylon, uh, dated on uh, BC uh, 567 March, and it says the Akukutu, I mean the British right, uh, uh, extended westward, and uh, it it lasted about two uh, two and a half hour, I mean oh, about an hour. And uh, there are further evidence uh, from Assyrian cuneiform tablets as well. Uh, they are uh, the trace copy of the uh, cuneiform tablets from the British Library. And they are the uh, transcription and translation. Uh, it generally says, uh, 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 discuss about the appearance of uh, some uh, strange celestial phenomena and uh, their interpretation uh, in the astrological context. And they discuss about the reddish groves and reddish crowds, for example. And uh, uh, although they, these records are not dated explicitly, they are, uh, we can find the signature of the astrologers uh, in these materials. Uh, and just like poor postdocs in the modern time, uh, they, they had a kind of tenure. And we can narrow down the rate they trench on this basis. And uh, uh, the longest one was the first one uh, learning uh, from 679 to uh, 655 BCE, and other two were 
677 to 666 BC and 679 to 670 BC. And uh, we also need to pay attention to the variability of the magnetic latitude uh, uh, because uh, the magnetic pole uh, moves over the time. And at that time, uh, the magnetic pole was stated in the Siberian side and uh, more closer uh, uh, to the to Mesopotamia. Uh, therefore, the magnetic latitude was somewhat higher. I mean, about uh, 15 degrees higher than the modern time, as visualized in this figure. And we have also checked the uh, data from uh, carbon-14, uh, which will be enhanced when the uh, solar activity is uh, not uh, that active. And uh, such kind of records uh, could be contextualized uh, when the carbon-14 uh, concentration was significantly reducing. Uh, which indicates the solar activity was a lot high. And interestingly, there are some uh, local uh, significant uh, positive excursion of the uh, uh, carbon-14 uh, concentration. And uh, Park et al, uh, as well as O'Hale et al in Toronto University has considered uh, that uh, this positive excursion would be uh, 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 solar eruption, uh, extreme solar eruption at the time. And while uh, it is difficult to uh, say something quite uh, concrete about the, their relationship with each other, one of such kind of uh, Assyrian records chronologically overlap with you know, such kind of carbon 14 spike. And, and, oops. Uh, 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 in order to uh, show uh, candidate orders uh, in Mesopotamia, we at least need uh, significant geomagnetic storms, which is comparable to the 1989 March storm, which showed all uh, down to Florida, if we take uh, the magnetic latitude at that time into consideration. And uh, we have further extended uh, uh, analysis uh, back in the time and further records have been uh, uh, detected from a, ch a Chinese, uh, uh, further ch a Chinese re record uh, has been uh, detected in the bum bamboo annals. Uh, this report has been controversially understood uh, in uh, Xu et al's work. Uh, Xu et al has uh, uh, understood uh, this uh, as a comet in uh, uh, 1034 959 BCE or an order in 950 BCE in the same book. And this, uh, this kind of discrepancy is derived from uh, their uh, variants of the original records because uh, uh, the bamboo annals have several variants. And uh, it's one of the variants, I mean, the, uh, which is known as current text, says in the 19th year of King Chao, uh, in spring, there was a fuzzy star in the way. And uh, another variant, ancient text, uh, said uh, in the last year of the uh, King Chao or, of Chou, uh, during the night, a five carat right uh, penetrated the way. And uh, Bumble, and actually, uh, we need to consider which variant uh, are more reliable. And uh, the original, uh, the original version of the Bumble unknowns are uh, lost at at least by uh, 10th to 13th century, and the uh, 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 modern or current text has been frequently considered as a kind of fabrication in the uh, 16th century. And the ancient text is a kind of scary reconstruction from a, a extant a citation from a further older version. And uh, scary discussions has, has considered the ancient text to be more reliable. Uh, therefore, uh, if we uh, try to interpret this report, uh, we need to interpret this as uh, 
the uh, uh, we need to uh, read this uh, record as during the night a five colored light penetrated the way and uh, although the chronology itself was also controversial we can uh, see as uh, several philological studies uh, to the uh, narrow down their chronological range for example uh, Cambridge history of ancient China uh, uh, indicated that the last year of King Chao was something like 957 BCE, and the Chinese uh, her research efforts have uh, located uh, King, uh, his last age was something like 977 BCE. And uh, uh, we have at least two different, different chronologies for this king. And uh, in this regard, uh, we can date this event either in uh, 957 BC or 977 BC uh, with a one year uncertainty uh, because uh, the calendar system was not the same with the, uh, our calendar at, uh, in the ancient China. And uh, this allows us to uh, 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 calculate the uh, distance from the contemporary North Magnetic Pole, uh, uh, which was uh, located about 14 degrees closer to China, uh, because it was uh, on the Eurasian side, that, uh, in contrast with the modern time. And at that time, the Chinese capital was in Haoxin, uh, 39 degree magnetic latitude, uh, and on this basis, uh, we we have uh, computed the magnetic latitude to be 39 magnetic latitude or or 38.9 in magnetic latitude. And uh, the text uh, said that uh, uh, it was during the night, uh, which is a nighttime observation and favorable for oral observation, of course. And it described the phenomenon as a five color light. And uh, we we have found a parallel record uh, in 1847 October. For example, Morgan uh, recorded a colorful oral display uh, in Cambridge on 24th October 1847, and uh, it, it uh, this phenomenon penetrated the way and the way is around the polar star, uh, indicate which indicates the. Uh, altitude of uh, more than 34 degree in terms of its uh, spatial extent. And thanks to the altitude information, we can compute the equator boundary of uh, the uh, candidate order. And it was probably uh, extended more than uh, 45, extended uh, to the lower equator side uh, than 45.5 degree or 45.4 degree in uh, latitude. And as I said, uh, there, there is a good correlation between the equator boundary of the oval and uh, the geomagnetic storm intensity in the DSD index. Uh, therefore, uh, we can uh, use a Yokoyama et al's model to calculate the magnitude of the uh, a probable geomagnetic storm, uh, something like minus 300 plus minus 50 nanotesert. And uh, we have uh, located uh, this report uh, in contrast with the uh, uh, decade of sunspot number uh, reconstructed uh, from, uh, uh, reconstructed by uh, uh, Wu et al. in Gettingen University and Usoskin et al. in uh, all university in Finland. And as you can see here, uh, these records, uh, are, uh, their Chinese records uh, have two, day, two candidate dates, but uh, both of them uh, stated uh, before their Homeric ground minimum uh, in eight, uh, 10 to 740 BCE. And this is actually a unique reference uh, for such kind of space weather event uh, before the Homeric ground minimum because other records, for example, the yearish uh, bar indicates the uh, chronological date range uh, for the Assyrian record. And uh, the yellow bar 
uh, is uh, indicates uh, the uh, candidate order in the astronomical diaries from Babylon, and green bars uh, indicates a kind of uh, alleged uh, candidate over uh, in the Bible, although their uh, reliability for this interpretation is a little bit controversial. And so uh, now it's time to, it's, uh, we are almost uh, arriving at the end of the time travel of this uh, solar activity reconstruction, I mean the space primate, and uh, uh, before 1610, uh, it is slightly challenging to uh, quantitatively extend our knowledge on the historical solar activity. Uh, still, uh, apart from the cosmogenic isotopes, uh, candidate or records play major roles to indirectly understand the long-term solar variability, as done by, uh, as, as was also the case with John Dalton's oral observations, uh, which uh, provided a kind of one of the earliest hints for the Dalton minimum. And the candidates all have been dated back to the earliest, uh, earliest uh, drawing in the Green Chronicle, uh, which couldn't, uh, which I couldn't introduce here because uh, it, it was also archival material and some procedures are needed. And uh, the earliest uh, reports in uh, 567 BCE in the astronomical diaries from Babylon. Uh, but uh, recent efforts have uh, detected some more uh, datable reports in their early period, for example, in Assyria uh, between 679 to 655 BCE, and in China, uh, the earliest report uh, in nine, uh, in China, the earliest report uh, could have been located in 957 or 977 BCE, according to the Bampo Annals. So, uh, these records allow us to uh, extend their chronology of space climate for three millennia, uh, um, as well as the history of space weather events as well. And uh, these records can help their uh, proxy reconstruction from pre-rings and ice cores. So uh, this is all for my presentation. Uh, thank you for your attention. Any comments or discussions would be greatly appreciated. I wish to say thank you again for all organizers and audience who came all the way here and have been, uh, arranged uh, this uh, important opportunity. Thank you. I, I would like to just an information uh, about the three rings and the ice cores, how they give information uh, on the solar activity. You mean the proxy record from yes. three rings? And yes. Because uh, you okay. use this information to integrate. Uh... Yes. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, firstly, uh, when their solar activity is uh, uh, active enough, uh, their solar wind will shut out their galactic cosmic rays, and it will decrease the injection of uh, the amount of the galactic cosmic ray uh, to the terrestrial magnetic field, and. Uh, but uh, if the solar activity is weaker, then the galactic cosmic ray uh, will uh, be injected to the uh, terrestrial atmosphere, and uh, that will generate more uh, uh, carbon-14. I mean, the radioactive uh, isotopes like carbon-14 or barium-10. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, we have a kind of good anti-correlation uh, between the amount of cosmogenic isotopes, uh, for example, of carbon 14 tree rings and uh, barium 10 ice cores, uh, with the uh, solar activity level, I mean, the sunspot number, for example. Uh, therefore, okay. uh, if we manage to reconstruct uh, them back in the past, uh, we can certainly get some idea about how, how the sun was active. Okay, thank you. And it seems there there is some question uh, about uh, the position of the magnetic pole and or can I answer this as well? Yes, please. Okay, uh, so uh, Dr. Miriam Madani uh, asked me about, uh, uh, say that I didn't quite understand the link between the move of magnetic pole and the uh, or uh, could you get back to that please? Okay, <clears throat> that's another good question. Uh, when the, uh, well, the aurora uh, tends to uh, shape a kind of oval shape, 
uh, along the magnetic pole uh, because uh, or uh, will be generated by the uh, mm. precipitation of electrons, uh, which will uh, whose band will be expanded when the magnetic storm was uh, large enough. And uh, what to say? Uh, therefore, uh, their uh, magnetic pole will be a kind of center for such kind of oval, and uh, they extend their uh, spatial extent from such kind of center. I mean, the magnetic pole indicates uh, 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 no, uh, correlates well with the uh, intensity of the magnetic storms according to the empirical studies. Uh, provided by Yokoyama et al, for example. Uh, therefore, if the more uh, magnetic pole is close to somewhere, I mean, it, currently, it magnetic pole is near Greenland. Therefore, in the American sector, we have more chance to see aura. Uh, we generally have more chance to see aura, although the magnetic latitude is uh, somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat similar uh, in the Eurasian side. Uh, I mean, in uh, what to say, in New England, uh, the geographic latitude is much lower than uh, the real, uh, the original England. However, the magnetic latitude is somewhat similar uh, because of the position of the, the inclination of the magnetic pole. Therefore, uh, uh, the chance of uh, seeing color is uh, quite similar uh, between New England and uh, England uh, if we uh, take the current position of the magnetic pole into consideration. I hope I am answering your question appropriately. So any other comments okay. or questions? Any other questions, comments? Okay, yes, thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It was good. Okay. I don't know if there are any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, thanks very much for your uh, presentation, for your interesting presentation. Thank and you. I think that we can uh, move uh, to the next speaker, uh, Laura Epp. I think, yes, I... Hello? I I authorize you to share the, the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, Laura Epp is a, a junior professor uh, in uh, environmental genomics uh, in aquatic systems. Uh, she works at the University of uh, uh, Costanza. Uh, her research is mainly focused on uh, uh, analyzing analyzing ecosystems in um, and, uh, and their history, their evolution, in particular using environmental DNA, eDNA, stored in samples such as uh, sediment samples or uh, water samples. Uh, the presentation of today is uh, uh, entitled, um, th this is the new title, okay, <laughs> the molecular paleoecology to track the history of species and ecosystems. Thanks very much for coming here and uh, please. Yeah, you're very welcome. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. And do you have the correct slide? Uh, do you all see the correct slide and not the presenter? No, I see the, I don't see the full screen uh, mode. Ah, you see the presenter at the moment. Yes, the yes? presenter, uh, yes. Okay. So I think that you see. have to go. Is it yeah. now? Yeah. Now, right? Perfect. Okay. okay. Thank you I have very two much. screens. I was not completely sure which one was the. <laughs> Thank exactly you very much. We're seeing. Okay, now you have it, right? Yes. Please. Okay, fantastic. So yes, yeah, so welcome. So I'm going to tell you about something else now, but also about um, natural phenomena, basically shaping environmental history, uh, and vice versa, humans shaping ecosystems and thus environmental history, and how we can track it using. Um, genomics and genetics. So what we do there, so I call the talk molecular paleoecology to track the history of species and ecosystems. And um, what we do now, no. Okay, 
So what we use is something that we call environmental DNA. And this is um, yeah, a depiction that I, I like to, to, to show initially, which is this um, picture of <laughs> myself uh, taking a spoonful of mud. Um, in this case, I must say it wasn't old enough to make the ice age world appear, but nonetheless, the idea of this environmental DNA that we take a spoonful of mud and basically we never see anything, but on the end of what we do in the lab on the computer screen, we get information on what the ice age world or whatever time period we're looking at may, look, may have looked like. Um, now, environmental DNA is something that now nowadays is has become much more popular and it is maybe you've also heard of this um the substance basically so we have dna everywhere in the world outside of basically organismal entities so outside of bodies or plants so outside of the organisms themselves or without seeing the organisms so not always clear if it's outside but it can be it's independent of them independent of seeing the organism and um, now it is usually used in the form of modern environmental DNA, modern eDNA, to survey and monitor biodiversity. And there are many, many applications coming up at the moment. Um, among them, you might know about this, um, the possibility to trace coronaviruses in wastewater. That is, for example, also an environmental DNA application. Um, and what I primarily work with is ancient environmental DNA, and that we use then to reconstruct past biodiversity. An ancient environmental DNA is obviously a very interesting substance because we can get a lot of information on past ecosystems from this. And I'd first of all like to talk about what we can actually understand. So also in comparison to what we can understand um, when we look at modern environmental DNA. So on the side here is a picture um, a figure made by my colleague, Mickey Barland at the Senckenberg in Frankfurt, uh, where you see a modern environment on top, basically, and on the bottom, you would see the, the, the ancient environment, and in between, basically, this the sediment cores reaching from the bottom to the top with all the different things that you would see. So here we see, of course, the, the top environment is an industrialized landscape. Um, we have here, we have a factory, we have livestock, we have a town there, oh, sorry. And we have, yes, and um, all these sorts of things. We at the same time have a different climate. We have here, for example, smaller glaciers. And in general, um, this looks different. We have a different, um, so this is, a, this is then at least initially a natural phenomenon that we, that, that we have a change in, in climatic, um, in, 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 in the climate. Um, and then we have something that is clear here that basically the biodiversity around this place has changed uh, quite dramatically. Now, because the colors are quite similar, it's not so clear, but for example, at least in this hypothesis of how it was, there were, for example, many, many more fish and different fish in the water. So this was definitely not immediately post glacial, but at some point in between. Um, yeah, so there was there was a lot of biodiversity. Oh, well, there were still mammoths, apparently, and other uh, <laughs> Pleistocene megafauna, but there was already forest quite substantially. And yes, yeah, so it was generally, it was a, a very, very different environment. Whereas at the top, we have, for example, we have the fields here, we have less things in the water. So the water is emptier in this case. And yeah, in general, it's it is different. So this is the this is on long time scale something that we can see. And when we come to very practical applications, I have put here together a comparison of what you could do with modern environmental DNA, which is you can use it in ecology, conservation biology, invasion biology, and biomonitoring. Whereas also these are things that you can equally use in um, the in ancient environmental DNA to look at slightly different things. So for example, process understanding to understand how things actually happened, track response and resilience, infer rates of change, determine drivers. We can possibly define restoration targets or historical pre-impact reference states, which is really a very important thing that we want to do in, in, in conservational policies um, and is quite difficult to do, to actually find what would be the natural state. However, 
if you think about going back through time prior to industrialization, then we're also, for example, at a different climatic time, we might be in the little ice age, so maybe this is not the best reference state. Nonetheless, we can see if we have recent anthropogenic impact, this is something that then we might want to see. We can, now this is important for, for what, we're, what we're seeing at the moment, one big problem at the moment is um, invasive alien species. So for invasion biologies, we can try and approximate first appearance states, in particular in ecosystems that are not well monitored. Most ecosystems in the world are not well monitored. So this is, um, this, this is definitely, I hope this can be a substantial addition to what to our toolbox. And we can track invading genotypes. Now, this is very important. With environmental DNA, we cannot only analyze species, so actually determine species, identify species, but we can look beyond the species. We can see where did they come from. We can look into the population, so we can look into intraspecific um, divergence. And finally, quite easily, so we can extend monitoring time series. As I said, most places in the world are not well monitored. So for conservation purposes, this is of course important that we want to see what happened before. Um, and we can do this, as I so we can do this on different time scales. And I'll talk about exactly where we can do what later. In many cases, we can actually go very far. So we can possibly go back to the ice ages if the archive that we have reaches back that far. Now, the quest one important thing here is that this environmental DNA was actually um, designed initially on such samples. So the field of environmental DNA that is now has now really become important in modern ecosystem analysis and in biodiversity conservation and is becoming more and more important now in the last years. The original publications to use such um, methods are actually from paleoecology, which is quite clear, quite logical, because in the, in the modern world, we can see many things, many things we cannot see, but many things we can. Whereas for past environments, we very often cannot. So we can only trace things that actually uh, have visible remains, right? If you look under the microscope. Now with DNA, you can go and see other things that you cannot see under the microscope. And this principle was then so appealing that this has now been used or is being used very, very much, very strongly for conservation purposes to, for example, also there in water, track the DNA of recently invaded or invading species to see where the, where, where the invasion front is or so, where you don't even see the species yet. But this is a principle that is actually not from like pure molecular biology or also recent ecology, but it's actually from paleoecology. And as uh, you can imagine, what I work with most of all are lake sediment cores. So lake sediment cores, because they are an excellent archive of ecosystem changes, um, we have, if we're lucky and, and, and the sediment was deposited nicely, then actually the, the picture, the photo that I have here, it's not that nice, but it's nonetheless a core. Um, you see here the, the layers are, the way that we went into the sediment was not perfect. Uh, nonetheless, we have a nice sedimentation, of course, through time and different layers, and we can do this. So this is a picture up on top is a platform, a coring platform on Lake Constance, where I am at the moment. Um, and below that, we're sampling this core, so very cleanly, and right next to it, this little plastic tube here with this clear liquid is the, um, that is then the, the DNA extract. Okay, so as I said, DNA in sediments is a nice, it's, it, it exists and it's really nice because you can, you can look at it through time. You can look through the different layers and you can get information. It exists as extracellular and as intracellular DNA. And it binds to the clay, sand, humic, and organomineral substances. And because of that, because it binds to it and then it is sedimented, it records the surrounding biodiversity as sedimentation and it is stored in the sediments with the temporal deposition of sediments. As I already mentioned, it is not limited to organisms with visible remains. This is really important because you can imagine that now we can look at all sorts of organismal groups that we could not look at before. Importantly, it also integrates over the ecosystem. 
leg sediments, not only the DNA, but also the rest of the leg sediments tend to do this. So they record both the terrestrial surroundings and the aquatic ecosystem. Here's a little figure from one of my earlier publications showing this for the north of, for a lake in the north of Greenland that also experienced a marine phase. So um, this blue part here is the, is the marine phase. And, uh, sorry, the blue part is the marine phase. And before that, it is the, um, yeah. Um, this, is, this is terrestrial and terrestrial again. And this is a record starting right after deglaciation. Um, yeah, so, I'm sorry about this scribble, which I had not seen. Now I'm going to show you a bit about how we actually do it, right? What do we do? What do we need to do? We need a lab. We need an ancient DNA lab or an environmental DNA lab, but we definitely have to go to a specific lab area. And we do this because it is very, very prone to contamination. So in this ancient environmental DNA lab, this year uh, is Anna Chagas, one of my PhD students, extracting DNA, so also clad in all these funny things that actually now after two years of pandemic don't seem so strange anymore. Um, it's not such a special thing, right, anymore that people walk around like this. So uh, this was, luckily for us, we did not have to get used to any, any new clothes and wearing masks and so on. We find that perfectly normal when we go to the lab, also to the eDNA lab, by the way. Uh, so we, we, we try to be as clean as possible. And in this particular lab, we then do the DNA extraction and the PCR setup or the shotgun library. And this is important. We do not run this reaction, this PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. We do not run this in this lab, but we go to a different lab because in this reaction, this is where um, DNA is replicated and the concentration of the DNA um, gets a lot larger. And this is when then contamination can happen. So we go to a different lab, the post-PCR lab, and then we do this PCR and we prepare everything for sequencing. We sequence on a, on a, for example, on an Illumina sequencer. This is what we use most of the time. And we get a lot of, lot of sequences nowadays with high throughput sequencing. And we can go through these with bioinformatic filtering and get identifications of the organisms through comparison to sequence databases. We can do further analysis, ecological analysis um, of the ecosystems or also on the sequences themselves, for example, phylogenetic or evolutionary analysis on the sequences themselves. Okay. Um, yeah, so now I'm going to, so these, this is what we do in the lab. And there are different ways of, of, of looking at the, at the um, I'm at this data, one is DNA metabarcoding. That is basically, in a way, a classical approach, which means that we get particular markers of a certain gene, with which we can identify the taxa in the sample, the so the organism in the sample as best possible. It does not always have to be to species level. It can sometimes only be to genus level or to family level, but as best possible. This is the same if you look at pollen, for example, many pollen are not identified to species. They are identified to, to some supra-specific taxon. Um, nonetheless, so with DNA metabarcoding, we can get very, very good identifications. And we do this, we do this so we get a high throughput DNA-based identification of multiple species. Here's an example of a sediment core in um, Siberia on the Taimir Peninsula, and this is just the aquatic species, aquatic plants. And for the aquatic plants, what you see here, you, you see that there is really something happened and it is quite a clear signal through the lake. So these are the 8,000 years. And what you see, so aquatic and riparian, so of the, of, of the surrounding of the lake directly in the next to the water. So what you see, for example, these are proper aquatics, hippurus, that then we have a peak in this, and these are the reads. So the number of, of times that we actually read this sequence in the sample. So we have a lot of reads down here and it's it slowly um, decreases. In between, there is a peak here, but nonetheless, so this is, this is probably the lake getting smaller and the, the population becoming smaller. And this is um, kind of mirrored on the other hand by, um, by organisms that live on the edges of the lake that then become 
uh, more more prominent in the in the data set. So this is one thing that we see. Another thing we see a very clear a signal of climatic changes, and this is in this. These are the macrophytes, the aquatic macrophytes. Nymphaceae are um, the water lilies, and Potamogeton. They're uh, what are they called? They're anyway. They're also aquatic plants. And the thing is that nowadays, in this here, in this place here, in the Arctic, at least still, there are no macrophytes. There are no proper aquatic plants, and definitely not not any water lilies. These actually need much much higher temperatures than we have there at the moment. However, there is a clear indication. So this here, I only uh, have some circles because um, the numbers were low, but they were definitely there, right? So this is, the numbers are low in this case. So this is without any quantification. However, they, they are existent. And this is then, uh, um, this is a climatic signal. Now, as I said, one thing that is very special to DNA is that we cannot only see the differences in species, but we can actually also see differences in under the level of species, so intraspecific change. And here, this is a, a completely made up data set that does not exist, but that is the kind of data that we can retrieve, which would be, so what you see here, you kind of also, this is also an Arctic example of, uh, for example, sediment cores that you would have from maybe going back to the beginning of the, I'm sorry, is someone, did you see this? Yes. <laughs> it's uh, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm. Uh, so, it seemed that someone was actually in the presentation. Yes, yes. We see just some uh, black lines uh, in the. Yes, presentation. and they have appeared. I okay, I'm going okay. to continue. Yes, yes, but it's okay. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, so if we have these cores, and what we would see here, this is then in Alaska. We see that there is a certain. Um, haplotype or genotype, right? A certain sequence type, which is different from this other sequence type, but only because um, we have these, so there's this T and A here, and there's a C and G here. So this is the difference. And then um, we have a difference in this core that apparently, so this would be this example, it's the same species, right? However, we see here, we see that we have this dark colored, um, genotype right at the beginning after the last glacial, whereas uh, further to the west we have, or whatever, wherever you stand. So in Siberia, we would have this, this light color genotype and then, which is probably not, but this is just to depict it, right? This could be any organism. It can be a plant. They might not even look different. This is just for depiction. They might not look different. They might look exactly the same. And they would be, if we had pollen, you would not see this. This is exactly the idea. So, but what we see here is that we have this type and we didn't have it here over on the other side of the Bering Strait. So the hypothesis then would be, aha, it arrived here later. It came there, whereas the species wasn't present. Whereas here, the species was present, um, but this, the, this type, and then apparently there was a turnover in the type. So there was maybe something like a competitive exclusion. Whereas over in this place, this did not happen. And now, of course, then we can think about what happened. So as I said, this data set does not exist yet. This type of like uh, geographically spanning data set of this type of data. But we have been acquiring similar data sets for single points. So for example, one point where we have looked into these in, in, into such uh, things, this is at the in time year, um, at the tree line, the the place where really the forest kind of fades into tundra. This is in this area. It's a it's it's a huge area of hundreds of kilometers. And this was when I was at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Potsdam. We did um, the group there is still working on this quite heavily involved in, 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 in this idea of tree line changes. So in this place, we have a tree line that is changing at the moment that has changed a number of times previously. And also it is an area in which different sister species come together. So there are different species of larches in Siberia. However, they are really very closely related. 
and uh, they can also hybridize. And so this is exactly the area where we uh, looked. And the first thing that we checked is how is the vegetation represented in the, in the lakes? This is, of course, really important to make sure that whatever you're saying is, is valid. So we collected surface sediments from lakes on the southern Tidier Peninsula. <clears throat> and what we found <clears throat> is that they are, there's a really good agreement between all of these methods, DNA, metabar coding, pollen, and vegetation assessment. Interestingly, in this analysis, the DNA metabar coding revealed most taxa. So most different identifications, whereas the pollen has, has only 43 and the vegetation assessment only 31. Now, this is really low for a vegetation assessment in the field. And this is probably also not true, it, but it depends on who does the vegetation assessment. This is an important point to remember that when you go and you take a sample for DNA, of course, whoever is in the field doesn't have to be very skilled. Whoever looks at the data has to be skilled in knowing what organisms are there, but not the person in the field. Whereas for, um, for going to the field as a, yeah, to do the assessment in the field, you, you need to know. So anyway, so it did really well. So we think that it is all very valid and a number of colleagues have done similar studies in the last years and have seen that yes, this it is, it's, it's a very valid signal. Now it's also valid through time. So this is then the next thing, a comparison of, of the data that you can get for larches, for large trees and for pollen through a core, a core that is, well, two cores actually, one is here 9,300 years in age and the other one, 6,800 and both cores, the, um, the number of large pollen and the number of DNA reads, which you see here. So this is the, the, this is the DNA metabar coding, only the, the large trees, not the whole vegetation. And this is the pollen, so extracted from this. And you see that the correspondence is really, really high. And also, if you look at the complete vegetation, and how it changed. So this is from a principal component analysis and how the vegetation changed. You see that the, the major changes are recovered at the same time. Mind you, in the full vegetation, it is not the same. We do not see exactly the same vegetation. So this means that it's also not just, you cannot just replace pollen by DNA, but you get a fuller spectrum. You get much more. And definitely the overall vegetation changes are, um, are the same that are recovered the same times. Now, as I said, it's not just the full vegetation that you can get, but also exactly these small scale changes, in this case, not within a species, but between very, very similar species that can actually also hybridize, but that are, are separated as species. And there I checked in, the, in these cores what haplotypes are there. This is, so this is mitochondrial DNA. So this is, it's called mtDNA, mitochondrial DNA. And so these different types, just the different types, it doesn't matter exactly where it is. And what there also, I found that I could distinguish this. And I found a very interesting thing. And that is that, so I thought this is the more Southern Lake and it is closer to the actual um, range of this Laric Siberica, whereas this top core is actually closer to the range of Larix Gmelini, the Gmelin large. So my hypothesis had actually been, before seeing the data, that probably I would have much more of this Larix Siberica, which in this case is this light colored stuff, in this core, in the CH06, whereas I would have more of the dark color, the Larix Gmelini, in the CH12. And then it turned out that the opposite was in a way the case. We did see, I did see at the beginning of the core, nearly exclusively in some samples, exclusively this white type. And when they are kind of gray, this is when I had both types. But in, so in this case, what we saw was a turnover. And it is already a very early turnover from one type to the other between five and 6,000 years. So there was always still a little bit. So I said uh, 10% if it's more than, so this is when I said it's a mixed sample. So there was always a little bit of this other, but there was nearly a turnover. And this actually, interestingly, this did not happen until right at the top for, the lake that is actually closer in range to Larix Bellini. The reason for this is that 
we modeled also the way that the populations were. So by with a model of a, of, of a colleague, Stefan Kruse, at the uh, at the Alfred Wegener Institute. And what is clear here is this is so this is the size of the, the populations, right? The dark blue. So this is the size. The bars are the size of the populations in general. And then again, there's the dark blue and the light blue, uh, the, the light green. The light green here is like the, the, the uncolored um, type. Whereas the dark blue is then the dark color type in, in, in this depiction. And because these are two species, they actually have differences in their ecology. And what we saw, and so basically this light color type should be more um, selected for, for warmer and less harsh conditions. However, it doesn't stay if it is in, so, it is competitively less, less, it's less competitively um, able to cope with, with, with dense population. So it is easily outcompeted by this other large. So when the populations grow in terms of the forest gets denser, the first thing that happens is actually that this haplotype that is associated with more harsh conditions can outcompete the other one. So this is really contrary to all the ideas that have that 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 were if you just look at normal like species distribution models we see here Larix Iberica um, is in an area with uh, lower thawing depth so less harsh temperatures less arctic conditions whereas the Larix Melini is in this very very harsh um, very very uh, continental and harsh conditions with um, a low permafrost thawing depth and so the initial idea would be when the conditions get warmer when our climate is changing we would expect and there were previous uh, papers on this an expansion of the range of Larix Iberica. Now, after this, looking back in time and actually seeing these differences empirically seeing what happened before when the when at a different time the, um, the forest got denser, we have to say this is not the case, quite the contrary. Probably what will happen first is that Larix melini will expand because it will outcompete Larix iberica. So this expansion will, will probably not be endless, but it, this is the, the first thing that will happen. So this is really, if you look at the, the paleo data, then combined here with a model to also explain what we're seeing, it is counterintuitive, but this is the process. So if you look at the process, you see that actually it's not just, it cannot be explained by just a change in the distribution according to maybe what you think the species needs ecologically, like this, the conditions. Yeah, so this is, this is an example of a very high resolution um, analysis. And we have now, so that you see here, we see the effect of the glacial, early glacial, um, the glacial refugia, we had only Siberica, and then with a higher population density, we have more Larix Melini. So the direct climate effect will be the change in population size, will be the densification of the forest, and thus probably actually the uh, an expansion of the range of Larix Melini. Really counterintuitive to what you might think. Now, this was only a single little PCR-based marker, and um, in the next step, we then went and, and looked at how much genomic information, so how much of a whole genome we could get from these larches. And this was for chloroplast genome, so it's not yet the complete nuclear genome, but the chloroplast genome. So this is a single circular molecule. It has a size of 120 kb. It is paternally inherited. Um, and it surprised, so, or not surprisingly, but fantastically, it was actually possible to recover full chloroplast genomes through a, this is the technique here, this is this hybridization capture, so this is a different type technique to the, to the PCR in which you can have many, many little pieces of DNA with which you construct baits, we call them, so we have these, these are these baits, and then the baits stick to the DNA in your extract and then you pull them out actually with magnetic beads and then you can sequence that and from this we could actually enrich our extract for this larix chloroplast genome and we could for one thing so this was first of all only on four samples so this is um, done by Luise Schulte at the Alfred Wegener Institute and she has now also continued since since I have left and is looking into large-scale changes and I, yeah, 
So this is this this is to be continued. But this was the first um, experiment there, and it was fantastic that we could see this. So this was really one of these the first times that we managed to get such genomic genome scale data from environmental DNA. Yeah, so, and it was also possible to track these different types. So the Gemellini and, Gemellini and Sibirica. Now this looks like you can do anything. You can get all sorts of data. However, I must now a word of caution here. You cannot always get everything. You can get an ideal uh, situation. So this is, if you want to look at mammals in the DNA, you can get, this is an ideal data set where you get a lot of mammals here, you see, and you can track pastoralism through time. This is uh, by um, Charlene Jigekovex, but there's also a, a kind of a typical <laughs> or common result that you do not find any of this, but rather you find a lot of different worms, earthworms. And we have um, a project in which we're also trying to do something similar now with plants, mammals, and then what we tried is mammal proxies, because we thought, okay, if the mammals are not so easy to get, then maybe let us check if we can get the mammal proxies. First of all, these coprophilus fungi, so fungi that live on dung, and that are also used as a microscopic um, proxy, so you can look under the microscope and find spores of these fungi. Then also endoparasites and ectoparasites. And this is, was then done, tried by Peter Zaber, who's a postdoc in my group. And he constructed again, this is a bait set. So this again, not PCR, but a bait set. And he tried to do this, but unfortunately he did not get anything better with his proxies than with, um, than, than looking at the mammal. So what you see, this is a nice, this shows actually what you actually have. If you just sequence it without any enrichment, the DNA that you have, what you have is you have most of it is unidentified. And then you also have um, bacteria, archaea, yeah, you have mostly bacteria, then some viruses. You have a lot of vascular plants. This is also why this works so nicely. So this, and these are then the, the eukaryotes. And here again, most of it is vascular plants. Then fungi are actually not so bad. Unicellular eukaryotes, so all the algae are also not so bad. Then some parasites, yes. Some fish, birds surprisingly, and also a little bit of mammals. But in general, it was unfortunately not easier to actually get um, the mammals more securely by, by not looking at the mammals, but looking at the at any of the other organisms. So this was all on terrestrial environments. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, aquatic environments. So this is actually where I started my PhD. This was a study in, in the Rift Valley in Kenya which is the Eastern branch of the East African rift system. And there are the interesting, it's interesting and fantastic for a number of reasons. But one of the things is for me working on lakes, there are many lakes in this area that are not very far and they are extremely different in conditions. So the chemistry of each of these lakes is extremely different, even though they are quite close to each other. So this makes them really, really good natural laboratories for all sorts of things among them, for example, the history of what happened there. So what I, I, I looked at is um, a record actually of a very, very small crater lake, Lake Sonachi, and this then only went back 200 years. I must say, I tried to go much further in a different lake. It did not work at the time. This was So this was during my PhD, where nothing was known about how to do this. So, and then and Lake Bogoria, it also this probably around 5,000, uh, 500 years. And this is on, uh, these are again haplotypes of a little organism of a rotifer and what I saw there and that was also really very fantastic that I got different types different haplotypes different types of the same species and partly also of different species and so here this um, there and this is in space also with these little colorful dots the colorful dots indicate different types of this rotifer, this Brachionus uh, rotifer that lives in all of these lakes, but there are actually different types of populations. Now, not only were there different types, but we could also relate them to things that happened in the core. In this case, also really natural changes. So 
it was there was a volcanic ash here so there's a sudden population turnover probably the crash of one population and um the establishment of another population then all through here we have this light blue type and here there's a, a period in which the lake level gradually declined and from this there was a gradual turnover in these haplotypes and this is kind of the so this is where I started and then for some years I worked more on these terrestrial organisms, especially on plants. You saw also in one slide why they're quite easy to get there's a lot of plant DNA in, in the sediment. <clears throat> but now I have I now at Lake Constance I'm attempting to look at both. So Lake Constance is here. Um, it's in the south of Germany. And bordering Switzerland here in the south and Austria. <coughs> um, it's a very large peri-alpine lake and it has, so I'm here at the Limnological Institute, that's also where I'm sitting right now. Unfortunately, it's not as sunny as on this picture. It's really a very lovely place, as you can imagine. This is the building. <coughs> some of these, so these are some of our little boats that we take to the lake to do some research. And here is the University Beach, which is also uh, quite a luxury. We actually have a beach <laughs> next door. And unfortunately, yes, today is not the weather for this. But Lake Constance is not only <clears throat> very beautiful and lovely to, to live by, but it is also very interesting. So it has a very dynamic coast glacial history. The current lake, so there were also previous lake phases, but the current lake <clears throat> started forming 17,000 years ago when the at the time of the deglaciation. So until then there was a glacier covering what is now the area of the lake. And then at 14,000 years before present, the lake was much, much larger and actually in extended into much of Switzerland into the complete Rhine Valley. And this is the current size of the lake. So now it is, is, it is much smaller. So a lot of things happened there. And another thing that happened, we had very, we had relatively intense settlements around these lakes. So these are the so-called pile dwellings that are common all around the Alps. Uh, this is a, a picture of a reconstruction. This is a museum that is um, that you can visit around here, sorry, um, of these little pile dwellings. And so these are basically these thatched houses that were built partly into the lake on the, and partly on the, on the shore. And there are many, uh -huh, there are many, many of these sites, archeological sites, and around Lake Constance, there are also really a lot. So this is, it's, it was intensely used very early on, basically, um, there was an intense use of the resources of the lake, and there was an intense settlement directly on the shores of the lake. Well, intense for these time periods, of course, now we have a completely different level of, of size of human populations. Nonetheless, so, and this is exactly it. So in the 20th century, the lake experienced a major eutrophication. These is, this curve here shows the phosphorus levels and um, these are the, yeah, this is also something that, this is the way that I, I think, <laughs> got to know about the lake when I was not yet, uh, I had never been here, but as a child, I heard about this within Germany. Lake Constance has this terrible eutrophication and it's a, a major ecological catastrophe. And the thing here is that there was actually, they managed to reverse this trend by setting up very strict measures for, um, for reducing the pollution to the lake and for reducing the phosphate levels in the lake. So this is a case where the, the lake and a lot of peri-alpine lakes have exactly this history. There was this eutrophication and now the trend is reversed. So that means the phosphorus levels are down again. And here by in the 2000s, it, they have really dropped. And of course, the question is what happened in between what happened to the lake and we have here at the Limnological Institute, a so called RTG a research training group, which is a graduate program for PhD students. On this question of response resilience and reversibility of lake ecosystems in which we are looking intensely at the lake and the first thing that we did we looked at these last 100 years and this was done by Anand Ibrahim who's now a postdoc in Jena and not here anymore, but this is i'm going to show one of the results. 
um, of her PhD, um, which was really lovely. So what you see here is um, an extensive data set. You don't see all the things that she did, but this is quite an extensive data set for three different with three different markers, one for microbial eukaryotes, so all sorts of different algae, one specifically, a reaction specifically for diatoms, and then one for cyanobacteria. And within these curves, this is this just this is not a quantity, this is actually the number of different uh, species that we found, right? So this is the diversity. These are or these are indices calculated from the diversity, i.e., the number of different species that we found. So what the first thing was there was a decline of diversity during the time of eutrophication, and this decline is reversible. However, there is something that was not reversible, and that is actually the change in the genetic makeup of the communities. So here you see this is a NMDS, an ordination technique. You see, first of all, these light blue colored um, Forms are the are, are the communities or the samples cluster in this area um, of this light blue, and then the samples of the uh, mesotrophic and then the full eutrophic phase cluster over here, and the re-oligotrophic samples. They are in a way, again, away from the, the the eutrophic, but they are not identical to the to the samples to the so the community composition is not identical to what was there before. Anand has done some more analysis on this um, more in depth than in this paper and actually in many cases the species or the genera that have that are now in the lake are the same in many cases not in all. So there might be a functional reversibility but on the level of genetic community it is not the same anymore so this is this is a very nice example of the trajectory of an ecosystem simply changing and there is no way that we can bring this back obviously functionally maybe yes and at the moment also the the lake is again an oligotrophic lake but it is definitely not the same a community that we had before another interesting thing that we saw is that there is a um that the main breakpoint of the community change happened before we humans became aware of the eutrophication. So the actual monitoring started in the 1950s and 60s because people then saw, oh, oh something's happening with the lake, somehow the fish is, the, everything, it, it's looking different and so on. However, and this was kind of what humans saw, what the fishermen saw and everything. So then this is when actually the monitoring started and when there were when when um, when scientists got involved more involved in this however when we look through the sediment cores we see that the that the major breakpoint of community change actually already happened in the 1930s and 40s so this means that this this was something that we didn't even that was not that did not come to the attention right of of the humans uh, however in terms of um, what it means for example to an alga and an alga or maybe a fish or so in the lake this was probably the lake had already changed at the beginning of the 20th century and we have now also looked at plants and looked at some other things there and it's really the beginning of the 20th century which is actually the intensification of urbanization around the lake that is when a lot of things happened in in different parts so this is basically this is for the last hundred years now as i said we have this intense human relatively intense human use already for thousands of years and in between it was very very intense for example in the medieval you see here on the um on the left hand this is a a, a picture a photo this is our coring platform and in the background this is the island of reichenau which is um it's in there is a big monastery there and it is now also intensely used for for vegetable farming and it has been intensely used for this for, for hundreds of years. It was, so there's an intensive agriculture and this has already been the way since basically many hundred years. So this, so it's a, it's an important medieval site with, with a number of churches. And um, so there was really a lot of, a lot of human use of the lake um, in different times. And so now we're looking exactly at this through time. And we're seeing where we have two cores. So one is actually one is here. This is so this is the island of Reichenau that I just mentioned. And over here, um, this is this is the this this little town is called Allensbach. This is Constance where we are, and the Swiss 
site is called Kreuzlingen. So there's this one core, which is in an area of probably intense human use. So there's also a Neolithic site here, one of the very early pile dwelling sites on this area. Then we have intense use in the medieval, we know that, and also in Roman times. So Constance, the name is a, is a Roman name, right, of our city here. So it has been used quite a lot. And over here, we have another core, which is in, a, in the upper Lake Constance and in an area that is very likely not under the same pressure. This is the upper lake, which is very large and very deep. And we'll have, so we hypothesize at the moment, we will have experienced um, previous periods of eutrophication in a much lesser state and a much, um, probably much later. However, so we have two cores, right? And we're working on these 11,000 and around 13,000 years of age. And I'll tell you a little bit on the first data that we have from this and this is so we have data from both but only one of the cores is properly dated now and this is this is it this is this from upper lake constants and the first data that we have now are the plants and they are already really interesting um what you see so this is 3000 uh, 13700 is the lowest dates that we have um and we see a lot of uh yeah we we see certain woody taxa already present in this time and then an increase here of shrubs first of all and then a bit later of the trees towards the beginning of the holocene so this is really we see this is really when it got warmer and the shrubs are earlier so this is climatically driven that is all clear and this is these are the first things that we see and then we see especially now in the herbaceous plants we see a next big change and this is then between as you see 2,500, and then also maybe if we go over here, Ortica, 4,200. So this is late Neolithic and early Bronze Age. And we see a tremendous increase in diversity of the herbaceous plants exactly here. They all appear exactly around this area, around this time. So, or most of them, right? So, and this is really a clear indication, we think now, and I think this will not change, of exactly this increased human land use and this is the forest clearing this is pastoralism and this is probably also the beginnings of agriculture so there are also we have um graminoids poesi which could also be cereals we don't know that yet because the marker that we use does not we, we only see that these are poesi so this could be cereals right so this is has to be looked at in more detail and this is happening right now. So Yi, Yi Wang is the um, PhD student who's, who's doing this at the moment, and she's preparing. So we will complement this then with the data from what actually happened in the lake. That is, a, that is one big question that we have here. And the other is also with, with, with other taxa, so also um, pastoral animals and, um, yeah, and generally everything. So also with, with a, with a non-PCR-based method to, to obtain these sequences. So yeah, so this is, I think that we will get a lot. This is what I can show you until now. And I hope that um, very soon, so by the end of the year, we'll, we'll have a more complete picture of this. Now for the end of the talk, I just like to just show you a little bit about where and where I think we should be doing this or we could be doing this and what we can get from these, from these types of records. You saw that I also worked a lot in the Arctic. I had, I also worked a lot in the tropics. So these are these, um, the F and the L is frozen terrestrial deposit and lake sediments kind of of the size that I personally have worked on. And you see a lot of it is actually in the, in the, in the Arctic. The reason for this is exactly because it is so cold that the DNA just keeps long, right? It's, it has a good preservation. Whereas in the, in the tropics, of course, the, um, preservation is much lower. However, it is not non-existent. We have preservation. So what we can get, and this is something that we're beginning to realize more and more also in the ancient DNA world. So initially, people working with ancient DNA just wanted to go you know, as old and spectacular or so as possible. And this is then in usually really best, let's say best possible in cold places. However, we can go to, um, to, to warm places. We can also get quite a bit of, of data, but the easy analysis is performed on the, in the timescale of 
100 to 1000 years. And now this is maybe a pity. However, if you think about it, what we actually want to know just about like how humans have been um, changing ecosystems and vice versa, how changing ecosystems have affect humans, the time scale that is most important for us as humans and human history or for us right now in the society that we live right now is of course exactly this, maybe the last hundred to thousand years, right? So we have exactly these, the all of these questions, the, the, different, the different things that we can look at, you see that actually towards the lower end, so that we have the DNA preservation potential. And if we look at all the things that we can actually look in detail at, nonetheless, there's, there's quite a lot. So I, I really say, I would really, this is, I find this very, really important that we don't just think this is something like to be conducted in these, you know, fancy environments where no one can get to like Antarctica or so. And, but we can just do it basically anywhere. And with nowadays relatively, relatively um, little effort and get a lot of very interesting data on, on changing ecosystems in relation to, um, to human use of the environment. So yeah, this is basically the more or less the end of my talk. Now for one little slide now with perspectives, the methods are strongly developing. So I showed you a little bit of non-PCR based methods. So shotgun sequencing, this is exactly where we're going to more and more because this DNA sequencing techniques are just becoming more and more affordable and we're getting more and more data. So the thing is, if you do not enrich first, you have to sequence much, much more, but that is becoming more and more doable. And then there are these enrichment techniques, which are also really good to use. So we can get full genomes basically, or full at the moment, full organella genomes. And finally, what we need, if we really want to do this, we need reference genomes. And this is something that we're lacking for most organisms. Of course, for humans, we have this and for many, uh, cultivated plants where we have started to get these genomes, but for many other species, we don't have this yet. So then we have the data, but we can't, cannot yet do anything with it. And I think this will definitely change within the next, I don't know, five to 20 years or so. And then I think that we can see much, much more even of, of what was happening um, in the organisms in the world. Yeah, and that is the last, that is my last slide. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Aura, for your presentation. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, OK. And um, for me, it's a very, very unknown word because I'm a, a geologist. <laughs> but it, it is a very fascinating word because uh, it is very uh, interesting to understand how we can reconstruct the history and the dynamics of a single species using DNA. It's very, very beautiful word and i don't know if uh, let's see the chat if uh, there is some uh... ah yes there are there are questions can Sorry. you see the chat yes yes Laura? yes i see the chat uh yes just uh congratulations for your presentation and uh, <laughs> Other people, other teachers are surprised by the incredible poten potentiality of uh, ancient environment. Yes, the DNA is. I don't know if somebody is not shy and uh, <laughs> wants to, <laughs> to ask a question. And also the potential uh, research for the future is uh, incredible. Yes, <laughs> it and, is. And I'm very yes. much looking forward to it. So every yes. time we start with a, with a new record, I'm always a bit apprehensive about whether <laughs> it will work again, <laughs> you know, whether we will actually get good data yeah. and so on. But uh, in most cases, we get very lovely data. So we're not through now yet with these lay constant scores, but I think that we will get very, very interesting data. And I'm really looking forward to see what actually happened in the lakes. This is a subject that we have not looked at a lot at all yet. You know, this the question of, we know a lot about changes in terrestrial environments um, because of, yeah, human land use, agriculture, cutting of trees and so on. But what actually, um, 
what this then also means for the aquatic environments where we actually get our samples because humans have always lived and do always live by the water they always use water they have always been using water yes um so yeah so this is something that i'm really really looking forward to this is um yeah <laughs> i'm excited to see the next there day. was a question uh, yes the the study yeah. expanded on how much time i think i imagine uh, how much time i in the past you mean how much i have been working on these things oh, no that how the, long can we go back how much i don't know the, the question is uh, the study expanded on uh, both ah, both <laughs> <laughs> well it depends so <laughs> the, the first question the cores of Le constants for which we're now getting the data we took them one of them in 2019 the other in uh, september 2020 and the phd students have been working on them for a year now and now the data is coming back um yeah <laughs> so so it's all you know doable in, in a phd so uh yeah this, that's that's the what so and of course we were completely delayed because we got the first core in 2019 and then we didn't have a lab at the beginning of 2020 and then it didn't come until summer 2020 because everything was closed so so we started late um i personally have been working on this <laughs> so my phd is already more than 10 years ago so i have been working on this for a long time and it is basically i would say only now that as a um, as a community, as a scientific community, we have in a way, you know, really got the hang of it and know what we can do. So we knew this. And the other thing is that only now people have become more interested. So um, now there's a lot of interest in our topics, but, and we haven't done it that long, right? Other, other I think other scientific areas um, take maybe a lot longer to establish. To become like to actually develop data mm -hmm. so and that's that's the first thing so the other question is yeah the the time span so there is the oldest record of lake sedimentary dna actually goes back 130,000 years so this is super super old and for most lakes this would not be the case simply because lakes are not that old so the oldest record of sedimentary dna is uh, around 500,000 years this is a study on greenland um of uh sediment below a glacier so right at the beginning of the when the glacier was formed so this is why this date is known but otherwise yeah so it can be very old and it very it very very much depends on the um on the preservation conditions so as i said so for example in if i go back to the uh to the slide here um it's or the slide maybe this so for example uh, we had a core from from cameroon i'm not sure which you're seeing now anyway um and this and there we could not go we took one sample it was a test one sample at the beginning and one sample a thousand years ago and at the thousand year old sample there was nothing left so it's it depends this was low this was a lowland lake in Cameroon, but then, um, for example, other lakes from Africa, for example, from high mountains in the Bala Mountains in Ethiopia, uh, we have a record that definitely also goes back multiple thousands of years. So, yeah, it's nonetheless, if you go to like the Arctic or Antarctica, then the it's basically in a way endless because everything is just deep frozen. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes. No, there are more questions. Last question. Yes. Yes. By Phil. You read it? Oh. Yes, 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 about how to enrich it. So yes, so there are, um, the classical way to enrich is by, by PCR, by polymerase chain reaction. So this is, you have these two primers and they, they stick to the DNA. And then um, with this polymerase, the, the part in between is, um, is prolonged. And then this is done again and again and again. But so this is the, this is the PCR, but the, the enrichment technique is, I can go back to the slide maybe. Yeah, here it is. So what you have, you have, so for, on one side you have your DNA, just, just the DNA. And to enrich it, then you can make these little baits 
Um, in this case, this is from homemade baits. You can make a long part of DNA. You can also have this synthesized by a company. This is this depends. But so in this case, you have this. You have your own. You, you break it into little pieces, and you make. So this is just DNA. The DNA that you are looking for, and you you um, ligate certain adapters that will then make these baits stick to magnetic beads. So you have this little piece of DNA, and you uh, <laughs> you you put it together with your with the DNA, and then the idea is so with single stranded DNA. So you denature everything; it becomes single stranded, and then your baits and the single strands, those that actually fit to the baits, will stick. And then you have to wait, and then you can capture, and then you can release again through denaturing. Through denaturing, you relate you release this again. You elute from from the from the baits, and then you can capture again. So you can repeat this. You you can do two rounds of capture, for example. And this then doesn't. So what you get, you enrich it. You do not have a complete. Um, it's not just what you wanted. It will still contain all the bacteria and all the stuff. But what you wanted, you will have more of it. You will have up to 10% more of it or so but it, so it's you know it's a it's an enrichment but it's a small enrichment but it is it is very effective if you know for example from a shotgun data set that you have a certain species but you've only got like three different strands of the species in this pool then you can go and you want to find out about the history of the species you can go and you can start enriching this and then you can get this more genomic dna was that clear more or less yeah yes okay thank you very much uh, okay Laura, for, uh, okay your bye. contribution bye bye okay remove the okay now we have uh, 20 minutes of um, break and uh, see you at um, 10 past 11. So welcome back from the coffee break, and uh, now we have uh, the um, the the third and the last presentation of the today session about climate is by Elena Soplaki. Is correct the pronunciation <laughs> um, from uh, Justus Leibig University? Maybe I don't know if I <laughs> said correctly. Oh, and yeah. Elena is a. Uh, a senior scientist uh, she studies uh, very different topics uh, such as uh, the mediterranean climate change from the past to the future uh, paleoclimatology climate reconstruction uh, climate change impacts uh, and uh, on society sorry um, in of the past and also um, extreme events the present day um, presentation, I don't know, Elena, can you share the screen? Because I authorized you to share the screen. The presentation is uh, uh, the medieval climate anomaly and Byzantium, a review of the evidence of climatic fluctuation, economic performance and society change. Can you see my okay, screen now? Yes, you can uh, uh, click on the full, Perfect. Okay. okay. Thank Good you very journey. much for coming here and to share with, with us your knowledge and your research. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Francesca. I, I'm really glad being here and uh, sharing with you some, some information from uh, some recent work uh, we have been doing. Um, actually, you will see that um, I'm going to use uh, quite a lot of the um, of the data, of the sources of information that have been discussed. And um, uh, what is extremely important uh, when we are doing this work, when we are working in the past, is to, uh, to be aware that there is um, almost everywhere several sources of uncertainty. So not only uh, in our um, um, textual data on documentary data, but also the proxy data, as well as uh, the, the model data, which uh, because we are looking into the past, we do have to take into consideration the different forcings that are not 100% resolved. Uh, 
uh, when we are looking uh, in the past. So keeping that in mind, we are trying to do the best we can to try to understand how periods in the past would look like, how were the links, the connections between climate variability and change and uh, societal uh, well-being. So I'm going to start uh, with, a, with a short information on the climate of the Byzantine lands on the during the, the medieval climate anomaly, trying to understand what were what could be the impact of climate that would affect uh, the, the Byzantine state and uh, and economy, and try to go and look also a little bit on the, how was this economic performance of Byzantium uh, organized. How can we uh, receive information? Uh, how can we combine all this uh, all this information? And then uh, some uh, additional uh, work on the on the paleoclimate, uh, which is the, the paleoclimate evidence that we are using, and uh, which is indeed used to uh, to interpret and then try to identify how these conditions have influenced the medieval. Uh, Byzantine area. Um, climate models as well, uh, we are going to use here and also trying to bridge finally the links between the climate and societal change. Let me give you just, um, uh, this, is a, this is just a global map where we can see uh, where we have a different Mediterranean climate region. So it is not only the area that we know well, the Mediterranean basin, but we do have Mediterranean climate in also other parts uh, of the world, as you can see, uh, both on the southern and the, uh, and the northern hemisphere. In all cases, we are talking about areas that have specific characteristics. They are almost 100% anthropogenic biomes, have been so much uh, um, modified by humans. Um, they contrib contribute to with a mosaic of habitats and also uh, very detailed and very heterogeneous human societies that have almost 100% modified and transformed uh, landscape. And we do know also very well that these are the areas that, um, that are actually uh, considered uh, climate change uh, hotspots. There's been quite a lot of work done on the, on the civilizations and the, and the environments in these areas. And actually, we could say that the Mediterranean is something like of a, of a single world of interconnected habitats. And please excuse the sound before it's home office. So there's a bell ringing suddenly <laughs> that I cannot control. So just a couple of words about the climate indeed in this area. This is the corner of the world we're going to look at. And um, uh, considering winter, a winter, the cold, but also at the same time, the, the wet part uh, of the year where uh, we see that uh, we have a smaller gradient between the, the coastal areas and the mainland, the inland areas, especially where we have higher latitudes and complex orography. This is where we are expected indeed to see uh, much uh, the larger differences and the lower temperatures uh, during uh, the, the winter time. What you can also see though down here is that we have a quite high temporal variability and towards the end uh, of the period we're looking at, we do see an upward trend, uh, especially during the last 30 years. However, this is not this significant, um, at least it has not been statistically significant characterized. When we look then uh, to precipitation, which is indeed why we are making the selection to this October to March, we see uh, this uh, very characteristic uh, precipitation pattern. We have a, a high spatial variability. We can see that the western coast of the peninsula has received very, very large amounts of precipitation of rainfall, which is indeed connected to the morphology of the area and the, the westerly circulation that is moving these um, uh, humid air masses that are uh, that, uh, that meet finally these, um, uh, these uh, uh, the, the, the mountain ranges and precipitate over these parts over the, the leeward 
uh, of the mountain. So you see that we have a strong gradient from the west to the east in both parts, in both peninsulas. What we also see as well, it's a very, a very high temporal variability. So we see changes in this winter precipitation from the mid uh, 20th century. And actually we do see a statistically significant decrease in trend, which is around uh, 10 millimeters uh, per decade. If we go now to the summer, you can see a totally different picture, of course. Um, very well known for the Mediterranean, the, the warm and, uh, and settled uh, um, and temperatures. Uh, we see that uh, we have, uh, again, this, uh, this, this well-known temperature gradient connected to the distance to the, uh, to the, distance to the, to the sea. And of course, we have the, the strong influence of the orography. Um, we have, uh, what we can see here is uh, uh, when we look into the, the temperature anomaly, and here again, it's, it's an extended, let's say it's the warm part um, of the year, we see that we have um, a statistically significant summer warming, some um, 0.13 degrees uh, per decade, which are even more important if we're looking at the, the last decades uh, of this uh, period. And we're going to the second characteristic, very, very characteristic uh, climatological climate of the climatological characteristic of the area, which is a dry summer. So very low rainfall amounts um, through, uh, compared to any other part of the year. And we see that in some parts uh, of, the, um, uh, of this area, we may receive even less than 10% of the total uh, precipitation uh, during the, the summertime. We usually receive precipitation um, either by fast passing um, uh, thunderstorms and, and locally, local, uh, uh, local uh, events. So what we could say uh, about the, in general, about the climatology of this Byzantine lands, we have temperature and precipitation, which are uh, indeed uh, during the, the whole year, um, they are characterized by higher spatial and temporal variability, uh, which is um, connected, of course, uh, not only to the atmospheric circulation, but it is also connected to the very high complexity of the orography of the morphology uh, of the area. And when we are considering these large changes, these large uh, differences in such a small area, because actually this is a small area, then uh, we may consider that uh, this complexity could also have an influence to the impacts that are connected to changes in climate. So what we are doing, uh, we're trying to, to identify uh, causal relationships and that between climate and socioeconomic changes. And to do that, we are taking, um, we are looking into a very, very detailed uh, to interdisciplinary and then comparative uh, analysis. And we are taking advantage of all information that is available for that period of time uh, and from coming from very different uh, sources. But um, what is this medieval climate anomaly? I'm sure that you have already heard several times about that, but I would like to take here the previous IPCC assessment report uh, with the extensive uh, um, uh, information on the, um, uh, on the, on the paleoclimate of the earth. So during the medieval climate anomaly, uh, we had multi-decadal periods where in some regions were as warm as the, the mid 20th century and in other regions uh, was as warm as in the late 20th century. So we are talking about the period back in time where we had favorable conditions. We had regionally at least warmer periods, which have been um, considered also several times as a, a question mark whether uh, they are crossing or not uh, the current 
the present time um, change, the present time uh, trends. Um, actually, what is making um, very different that period back in time uh, to today is, is that we did not have all around the globe a synchronous change as we do have now. Plus, what is extremely important is we didn't have this space that we are experiencing nowadays. But we had uh, climatic conditions, we had atmospheric circulation that was um, favorable or was bringing uh, warmer uh, periods in different parts uh, of the world. So what, is, was, what was really happening though in this uh, Byzantine period? How was the Byzantium during the medieval climate anomaly? We knew from historical sources that it was an expanding society. Economy uh, was really thriving and uh, there were already complex political and cultural institutions which were uh, quite advanced for a pre-modern uh, society um, compared to, to other parts of the world. That, gave, that had given, of course, the Byzantines the advantage or the, the luxury, if you like, that they could write and they could materialize information and uh, could materialize descriptions and um, um, on, uh, on different um, um, aspects, on different impacts that were um, observed that, uh, the, during these periods. And then at the same time, they had the possibility to go and, and investigate what was really um, uh, happening uh, during these periods. So what uh, we are looking at actually uh, is um, a, a period of prosperity, uh, this ninth to the, 20th, to the 12th century, where we were at the time uh, after a recovery um, from the, this so-called dark ages, which historians actually do not use anymore, uh, uh, dark ages as, um, um, as a description because it's uh, simply uh, misleading. And this period brings us up to the fall of Constantinople to the Latins in 1204. And of course, we are looking mainly at the northern regions of the Eastern Mediterranean. So what we have done, uh, we have put together all uh, interesting events uh, in the history of the Byzantium, because when we are discussing um, the links between um, climate change, climate variability, and, uh, and societal and economic uh, impact, we do have to take into consideration as well um, also other events as uh, political, as um, uh, worship um, taking place, and uh, of course, uh, how were the conditions also uh, within, but also outside the uh, empire. So the Byzantine society at that time was, as already said, a pre-modern, pre-industrial society which was um, largely uh, dependent on agriculture for its uh, prosperity, for its food. Uh, we had an extensive cereal cultivation that made more than 50% of the annual intake of its inhabitants. We had also at the same time wine and olive cultivation, which was actually um, foods that, uh, that were available to almost all uh, cultural, all societal strata. And this meant that um, weather variability and tax income had something to say, had links with this um, agricultural output. What I didn't say is that, uh, and I would like to add here, is that there were already at that time specific areas that were, uh, that were experts, that they were dedicated to the production of wine and olive oil which means that any changes in the, any um, unfavorable weather conditions that could influence this production uh, of, uh, of wine and olive oil uh, could actually bring the area into um, an economic, uh, economic difficulties. Um, 
As said already before, the cereals were the major uh, impact, the major um, uh, intake um, for the for the inhabitants for the Byzantines, and uh, what we have here is um, the links between those most important crops and also uh, the uh, climatic conditions that could, um, on the one side, support uh, a good harvest, but also on the other side could threaten uh, the uh, the harvest and could finally bring uh, up to um, uh, really a crisis from subsidence uh, crisis to, to social uh, instability. So we can see, for example, that cereals, as already said, the most important um, regular adequate spring rainfall could actually uh, ensure a good uh, harvest while uh, very cold winters and spring drought and even more some uh, early uh, summer heat waves could be uh, problematic uh, could actually cause uh, large issues to the harvest of cereals. Um, wine had, of course, a different period, had, um, where sunny summers are those that are, as we all know, uh, are expected to be uh, those uh, conditions uh, to have a very good um, harvest. And, uh, but, uh, and uh, while uh, threatening conditions would be um, uh, spring frost and also um, very bad, uh, very strong um, uh, summer heat waves and even worse, some late summer rain that would act actually uh, go um, fall exactly on the, on the period where the, the, the grapes are about to, um, to, to become ready. Um, and then the rain could absolutely uh, destroy them. Um, olive trees on the other side, uh, characteristics, uh, characteristic, you know, characteristic tree, characteristic plant uh, of the area um, fa is favorable, uh, does can definitely go with dry climate, just require some, some spring uh, rainfall. And even if um, uh, olive trees are really strong and can um, uh, can uh, can support uh, uh, low temperatures during the winter. Uh, prolonged frost and that even going below uh, minus ten uh, degrees could definitely uh, damage the the harvest. The information we are using uh, for for the study of the Byzant Byzantium economic uh, performance. Uh, have different are, dif uh, are of different types. We have historical, uh, either narrative or archival uh, data, and uh, we are receiving information either from the taxation uh, system uh, or even information about population, about the cultivated uh, lands, about the production uh, and the different scales, and. Um, and usually uh, we have uh, indirect or direct uh, mentions on, uh, on economics, on finance. Um, it is quite important to know that uh, in this response, in this respect, we have uh, not only quantitative, but also qualitative uh, information, which requires a totally different um, study of this, uh, of this evidence. While at the same time, we have a very different chronological precision that could go from some decades to, um, to, to longer uh, periods. We use also archaeological coin finds, what I'm going to show you just, uh, just later. And uh, we are discussing, of course, uh, about uh, monetary circulation on an, on an area where these finds uh, are coming from. Uh, they are usually discussing, the, um, uh, representing a, a couple of decades, um, as they are, of course, the renal uh, periods, as we, we were using them from the, the head uh, of the coins. There's also information from um, sites, so about settlements uh, coming from archaeological surveys. 
And we also receive information from palynology. So paleoenvironmental evidence uh, providing information on the conditions, uh, um, on the climate condition, indirect climate conditions that are coming uh, from the uh, ab abundance or lack of plants, but at the same time could also give us information about how much anthropogenic plants have been um, uh, have been used uh, in those uh, areas. So, for example, we can describe whether uh, we have a, a higher percentage of cereal pollen. Uh, so, we are expecting to have higher um, 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 that the, the anthropogenic plants. Uh, which are translated from the cereal pollen uh, uh, has been uh, abundant, has been um, representative of the area for several, uh, actually, uh, hundreds of years. So this is the area uh, we are going to, to look at, and I would like to show you um, this monetary circulation. Uh, so actually coins that people are losing um, in the market, uh, in the in the urban areas, and uh, according to their frequency, according to the amount that we find, then we can say uh, whether we have um, um, a stronger or a less strong uh, economic financial uh, situation uh, in the um, in the areas. We have also information about settlement density and that from archaeological uh, surveys. And um, in this case, uh, we are looking uh, mainly into the central to, um, to Southern Europe, as, uh, as we can see uh, here. What we also receive, and, um, uh, and this is really interesting, is relative changes in population numbers. And that compared to levels, we're trying indeed to consider how changes on this in the population, the inhabitants is, uh, is taking place. Again, uh, here as well as also in the previous um, uh, evidence, uh, we have to take into consideration that um, uncertainty plays a very important role and we always have to take it uh, we have to take it into consideration when we are drawing conclusions and trying to, to come up uh, with, um, with our uh, research output. A very important, um, finally, a very important um, source of information is the, are the proportions of cereal pollen. So what we see here is how things have been changing with the cereal pollen that were found in them and the balinological excavations and, uh, and, uh, and after the, the laboratory work, the lab work that is taking place. So what we can see is that relative change uh, of these, um, of, the, for, of, uh, of cereal pollen and that in different parts in the, uh, in the Byzantine uh, Empire. We have the possibility and we have actually, if you would like as well, the luxury to use uh, textual evidence, documentary textual evidence that is coming from the medieval Byzantine region. And um, the, the very, uh, the, the big advantage of those, uh, those data is that we have a very high temporal, temporal resolution. Uh, we do not have uh, always a mix of temperature and precipitation effects from the descriptions uh, that are found in documentary evidence. Uh, we can cover all months of the year while when we are looking on more specific periods, uh, or if we are looking, for example, on, or tree rings or uh, plants, we do know that we are we have we are we have representative information only for a smaller part of the year, where actually these um, uh, our proxy um, uh, are sensitive to this uh, to the subannual variability. We do have a very high sensitivity to changes uh, to any anomalies or deviations from mean conditions, but also natural. Uh, hazards, unfortunately, we have quite a lot of information from the Byzantine, uh, um, from the Byzantine areas. 
However, there's quite a lot of um, disadvantages that have to be uh, more in mind, taken care is that we are, we have usually this continuous and heterogeneous, so it is in, almost impossible to come out with, with a long uh, reconstruction uh, from, from these data. Um, we do always have to take into consideration that there were um, human, the human impact uh, is quite strong here. So, um, which is actually what we always have to do when we are looking on, on historical, on uh, historical evidence or descriptions of events, uh, because um, we have to consider how far the, the writer was from the area and the time uh, of these descriptions. Uh, what is the, the personal concept, the personal perception of these events, and, um, and also whether our historian uh, tends to overestimate or underestimate um, the, the descriptions, the, the conditions that, uh, that are found in these uh, stories. Um, when we have taken all this information that Ioannis Delelis has put together for quite some time from the Byzantine uh, area, from the Byzantine uh, periods, uh, we can see that we have some specific uh, characteristics as these are um, the information that we receive um here um we have taken the information of um, the historical information and we try to to make pictures uh, out of those and what we can always say is that we have uh, quite some specific uh, characteristics of those events we do receive mainly uh, information that is um uh, describing anomalous conditions uh, we don't find descriptions that are describing we don't find any records that describe uh, normal conditions. So actually everything that we find has something special because it's attracting, of course, uh, the, um, the, attracting the, the attention uh, of the writers. And of course, as you can very well see, um, most information is coming from uh, the capital of the Byzantine Empire. Uh, so everything is around Constantinople and any adjacent uh, areas. So we are using this information as well, together with uh, our, oh, I should be here, uh, together with um, natural proxies, paleoclimate natural proxies from these areas. So uh, what we have is um, a selection of specific and, um, and, and well recovered uh, information so we use uh, annual sea surface temperatures we use tree rings uh, we use also uh, speleotherms from several caves uh, in the area as well as uh, information from barf uh, lakes and uh, as, as you can see from the different descri descriptions the information we receive on the climate it's very heterogeneous and uh, is also referring to different parts um, of the year. Um, we have been trying, we try to, to bring all this information together in order to, uh, in a way that we can compare or at least see how the climate variability, how climate was, uh, was varying uh, in that part um, in the past. And finally, we are using climate models. So what we have here is a CIMIC-5, two CIMIC-5 um, uh, early um, Earth system models, so large scale and, uh, and also rather coarse uh, data, but um, we are also using at the same time uh, regional climate models, so much finer um, uh, resolution uh, taking into consideration uh, more realistically the topography of the area as well as the, the very um, um, the very well known coastline uh, of the of the eastern uh, Mediterranean. So trying to to receive the information uh, on as as representative as possible uh, for the area we are looking at. So I would like to go then to um, to this twelfth century. 
where we know for the South and Greece that the, the 12th century, so 1100 to 1200, was one of the most prosperous times. As you can see here, we had a demographic expansion, um, at least over central to and southern uh, Greece. We had um, a significant monetary exchange, as you can see from the blue line here um, in our finds uh, from the, the coin finds. While we also know that during that time, the Byzantine Empire was relatively strong in terms of political power. So um, during this period, we have information from our paleo uh, climate evidence, and we do know that we have relatively high sea surface temperatures, which is, uh, of course, connected. Uh, we cannot say that this is just temperature that is coming from uh, during the summertime. We are talking about especially these, um, uh, these uh, uh, marine, uh, uh, marine um, proxies. Uh, do represent uh, longer periods uh, of the of the year, so we are expecting these higher uh, temperatures. Um, we can see from tree rings over the um, the northern uh, northeastern parts uh, that we had uh, a relatively low um, precipitation, as can be seen here. The same is evident as well uh, over the, the lakes. Uh, actually, uh, we can see that this uh, effective moisture, which is the main um, variable that these uh, caves are uh, providing, uh, shows um, uh, drier uh, conditions. And uh, actually, this is also supported by the uh, the ESM uh, here for the 12th century, as well as from the um, regional climate model, as you can see as well, that we are, have an extended actually a uh, winter dryness and considering that winter it's, it's a very important um, season for the area, we do, uh, cons we do understand the, the significance. What we also know is, especially when we are going um, further um, to the, towards the end of the period, we see here on um, much more detailed and still it is not as high resolution as we would like, but still we can see that when we are here over this uh, southern part of Greece, the extended central and southern part of Greece, we see some uh, dry uh, periods. What we know, though, from our uh, data, from our uh, serial data, is that in central Greece and, and uh, in Macedonia, the economic growth, when we are discussing that with, uh, in, the form, in, the form, in, the, in the form of, uh, of cereals, uh, is actually continuously uh, increasing. So we didn't have any change. Uh, throughout the, the whole century, although the con these uh, unfavorable uh, conditions. And you were supposed to see something here. Oh, yeah, finally. While uh, we also see that we had uh, these uh, actually um, no reduction in the, in the population um, that we find even more uh, to the north of um, of Greece. So what we could say is that uh, we are talking about um, a resilient uh, Byzantine society, at least over the southern Greece, and that uh, for the uh, for the 12th uh, century, although the uh, relatively unfavorable climatic conditions. I need to get to the demand of jump on my mind. If we go then um, to the other side. Uh, of the Aegean, and uh, we look exactly at the same uh, information, um, considering that uh, these uh, these um, these data, these uh, these proxies uh, are actually uh, on both parts uh, of the of the Aegean uh, Sea. We do know that after the Turkish conquest, we had drier conditions, and as is visible from uh, from these uh, proxy data across the whole um, Mediterranean, but Byzantine uh, Empire. Uh, 
Um, we had also an important uh, decline, if we can see uh, here, especially over southwestern Anatolia, of the agricultural production, uh, something that had started already before the, uh, the beginning of the 12th uh, century. And actually comes the question that what was uh, pushing, what was making this change uh, happening uh, in the, in the 11, already before the, the, the 12th century, and why did Western, Anat why Anatolia um, has, um, has, was behaving uh, so very uh, different when we are comparing to uh, just the other part uh, of the Aegean. So what we do know is that um, already before, somewhere at the end of the 11th century, we had the invasion, uh, invasion of the Seljuk tribes and also a strong migration of um, Turkoman nomads um, in true se into central uh, Anatolia. That had as a result a strong uh, economic instability um, to Anatolia and even uh, a collapse uh, of the economic uh, system. Uh, considering these events and uh, how this, um, this ha has taken place, um, the question is then going a little bit further. Um, we do see that we have the Seljuk tribes migrating, uh, invading, and also Turkoman nomads uh, migrating uh, into the area. Our question and our, our next question, our next research um, topic is, what would be actually uh, the reason that these Seljuks were expanding? Why did they invade uh, the, the parts, um, the eastern, um, and the eastern parts of the of the Byzantine Empire, and actually, was was there any was climate also playing a role uh, to this uh, expansion? So, I hope that I could try to I showed you how um, um, paleoclimatic and archaeological historical approach uh, could work together and address. Uh, paleoclimatic uh, events uh, and assess at the same time um, the impact that these may may have to the uh, to the societies uh, of complex um, um, of the complex uh, Byzantium. We have made a, a comparative use of paleo models in combination with paleoclimate information and societal uh, evidence where um, all natural proxies, textual documentary proxies, together with information from uh, archaeology, um, can actually provide additional uh, knowledge or better knowledge of the drivers that the climate system or the triggering actually um, that, uh, that the climate system has provided to, the, to this coupled uh, climate society. Uh, system. What we have to take into consideration, and this is extremely important, is that uh, we have to be very cautious when we are interpreting uh, all these uh, input as we have a high complexity and, uh, and a high spatiotemporal heterogeneity, while all archives, either they are uh, historical archives, um, archaeological finds, or natural uh, proxies, but even more, uh, but it, and, and as well as um, as climate models, uh, they do um, they are yeah one would say rich in um, uh, in uh, in um, uh, uncertainties, and these we have to take them into consideration. Uh, when we are describing and when we are drawing our conclusions. What we could say is that the 12th century, at the climax, let's say, for the Byzantine, for the Byzant uh, uh, for the for the for the Byzantine Empire was characterized by uh, considerable agricultural productivity. We had substantial monetary exchange and the demographic 
uh, growth. The conditions that the climate conditions that characterized that period was um, warmer temperatures, high precipitation variability that was um, differently um, uh, represented, differently expressed in the in um, in this in in the in the, uh, that smaller corner actually uh, of the world. We had dry, uh, drier winter conditions, but we also saw that 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 was not really affecting the, the Byzantine socioeconomic uh, system. What we could say is that climate was a contributing factor to these changes that were observed, while the Byzantine socioeconomic system was vulnerable to climatic changes, but that was in the cases where we have also considerable internal or and external political and, and military pressures, as we could see the, the totally different behavior, the totally different resilience that was shown uh, by the, the Eastern part of the Byzantine Empire. And actually, we could say that the resilience of the Byzantine society uh, to, the, to the impact of climate variability show us that we cannot consider only direct links between climate and then socioeconomy, but we have always to take into consideration those indirect links, these additional factors that, um, that actually uh, prepare um, a resilience or destroy and, uh, and the, the, uh, the status uh, of a society. So what we saw um, areas with very similar climatic conditions had uh, quite different uh, behavior, uh, quite different socioeconomic uh, impacts uh, experiencing uh, that, that were experienced during uh, actually uh, one uh, century. And uh, with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I uh, would be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Elena, for your presentation. I was really impressed by the huge amount of, um, of archaeological and uh, paleoclimatic data to reconstruct the, um, to, for uh, climate reconstruction. And also, there is a, a take home message that climate can change our social economic future. <laughs> so we have to be very. <laughs> Absolutely. Very you know? careful. Yeah. Yeah, you know, Francesca, while we were uh, while we were doing this work, I and mean, you could you could have possibly seen it already that um, this this work cannot be done just by uh, by climatologists, uh, paleoclimatologists, but it's a, uh, it has to be a, a very strong collaboration by all those uh, disciplines that are related because uh, it's extremely important that we to consider that we can we do not have the knowledge we cannot just uh, we cannot judge whether um, uh, historical documents should be taken as they are or whether we would like to have uh, or whether we should be careful on the um, on on what is written and what information we uh, we receive from those so um, and also to get uh, this uh, this wealth of information as you said uh, already and um, that was uh, that is an, a very important uh, aspect. And what we were actually considering, and this is what we are trying to do now, is how could um, the different types of societies, because uh, we were talking about the pre-modern society, still complex. So um, we, it was not just agriculture, there were many more aspects to be taken into consideration, but still it was not as complex as our current society. Yes. So the question was, how much can we provide um, advice? How can we provide information and advice to, to current conditions, to current policy makers? Mm -hmm. And um, so in a way of, um, this is what we had faced then when we had less, uh, less complexity. And 
how this could be translated uh, in, uh, in current conditions. And actually we are preparing a, an environment for policy panel uh, where we are looking uh, at those uh, aspects. So what you said for the future, yes, it's extremely important how climate can, can affect. Yes. And also, okay, we are forced, we are forced in nature because uh, there is a, an anthropic contribution that in the past uh, was missing. Exactly. Mm. exactly. Okay, any questions from uh, the web? Um, just comments, uh, very nice comments for your presentation. And uh, there is one question, can you give us uh, a plausible explanation of the resilience uh, you talk about? Um, about the, the information on the, um, for the Byzantine society. Um, I do not know if I could uh, say uh, explanation of the resilience. Uh, I mean, what we could say is that at that time and that specific period and that specific area, um, we could see that um, changes that were coming from, I mean, climate, resilience to, to climate change, changes that were coming from climate variability um, did have uh, an impact. However, the impact was not as large to, uh, to destabilize the socioeconomic system of the Western part of the, of the Byzantine empire. Uh, that was something that we could see from the totally different changes, uh, the totally different data that, uh, that we found uh, as far as socioeconomic changes uh, were concerned. While on the other side, we had a very strong um, external, um, ex external um, uh, force uh, that was uh, already weakening uh, that part uh, of the uh, of the society, uh, that part of the Byzantine Empire, which means that they were actually uh, stronger or, uh, or additional uh, factors that were reducing the, uh, the resilience uh, of, the, uh, of the Byzantine Empire uh, over, the, over Anatolia. So that is how uh, uh, we could consider that uh, the resilience on the Western part was there uh, because the system was well established. There were nothing. There was nothing coming to to, uh, to force even more uh, uh, an external factor, which was not really taking place uh, on the other part of the of the of the Byzantine Empire. Okay. Any other question? Mm. No. So Elena, thank you again for your uh, presentation. And uh, this you. is the program for tomorrow. And I don't know if uh, Jean-Luc want to add uh, some uh, information. No, uh, see you tomorrow at two, at 10 past two. So European oh, time. Uh, hands on practice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you very much to teachers and especially a special thank for uh, uh, speakers for this very interesting presentation. And I will send you an email for sending us the PDF presentation for teacher to just to, to put in the web. Thank you very much. Bye bye to everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you very much.